probably know a bit about us already if you've been reading up on WashU or you've gone to some of our general information sessions. So Arts and Sciences is the largest of the undergrad academic divisions. Uh, a little less than two thirds of WashU undergrads are getting their degrees from us in Arts and Sciences, but pretty much all WashU undergrads take at least some of their classes with us. So we're kind of that central hub of the, the undergrad experience. Uh, we're not just the largest, we're also the most kind of academically or intellectually diverse, which makes sense for arts and sciences. And so we cover everything from the performing arts, uh, dance, music, theater. Uh, and so the, the visual arts are in the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts. So painting and fashion design and drawing and sculpture uh, is, is in Sam Fox School, but music, dance, and, and theater are, are with us. Uh, through the humanities, English, languages, history, classics, philosophy, art history, uh, the social sciences, economics, psychology, political science, sociology, you know, through to the natural sciences, biology, chemistry, math, physics. And so we really encompass uh, a lot of different areas of study that translates to our more than 70 majors that our students can choose from. Um, but Ultimately, we are across all of those divisions, you know, we're a research university. And so your faculty, your professors that you're learning from in your classrooms are themselves scholars that are really at the cutting edge of their various disciplines. So I have a couple of stats in here about awards won by our, our faculty. And it really is uh, something that we want our undergrads to take advantage of is the opportunity not just to be a part of our educational mission, like the transmission of knowledge, but also a part of our research mission, which is the creation of new knowledge. And um, we, we want to get our undergrads exposed to and engaged in that innovation, basically as soon as they're ready. Uh, and one of the ways we try and make connections for our undergrads to our faculty and to our research enterprise is through our first year programs. I'm going to talk a bit more about those on the, with the next slide, but for here, I just want to say these first year programs are, are not mandatory. We don't make all of our students take one of these first year programs, but they are interesting enough that, you know, the, the large majority of our students will choose to opt in to one of those programs. Another thing that's really important to our community that uh, our students choose to do without there being a formal requirement is, is service. Our students want to make a difference in their community, in the St. Louis community. And so half of our students tell us they formally volunteer during their four years at WashU. And this can be through any of a number of different mechanisms, either through student groups, through you know, your own personal relationships with particular organizations or causes, or through an increasing number of courses that we call community-engaged teaching or community-engaged learning. And this other places call it service learning. It's pretty much the same thing. The idea is that you are both learning concepts and theories in the classroom while applying them um, towards making a positive impact in the local community. And so these classes range from some of our language classes where students are, um, for instance, in our Swahili and our Arabic language programs, students are working with local refugee populations. Uh, another Spanish language translation class has students uh, working with Spanish speaking families who have brought their children to Children's Hospital in St. Louis for treatment. And while the child is getting treated, the family's living in St. Louis. And so our students are helping the families kind of navigate their way around St. Louis and settle in. Uh, many others of these classes are, are focused on education. So one has our environmental studies or environmental science students designing and teaching environmental science labs in, in local middle schools. And then still others are connected to the particular topic or field of study. So our Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Department actually has a really great set of these courses. So as an example, there's one on uh, the incarceration of women. And in the classroom, you're learning about kind of the, the sociological phenomenon of the incarceration of women, um, prison systems, how the, the US prison system over time has dealt differently with women, um, the impacts on society and families of incarcerated women, and then our, our students 
are reading to or tutoring children of incarcerated mothers. And so it's really this both a chance to do some good, but also a way to get a really personal and, and applied understanding of the concepts, the big concepts that you're learning about in the classroom. So these are opportunities we keep building because our students are demanding them. So we're increasing the number and diversity of these classes uh, all the time. And I'm sorry, I mentioned my dogs up front and they are very upset about something going on outside right now. So I apologize. They're probably going to keep doing that. So we'll, we'll keep going. Um, Okay, so I mentioned 70 plus majors and there are students in every single one of them, but of course some of our academic areas are a little more popular than others and the, the most popular academic interest uh, in arts and sciences is not actually a specific major, but it's broadly pre-health. Students who are interested in pursuing a career in the health professions, whether that's as an MD or um, in public health, uh, getting a, a dentistry degree, a veterinary degree, occupational therapy, physical therapy, pharmacology, nursing, you, you get the idea, pre-health broadly. And it's a place where we're really proud of our track record of supporting our students in those goals and ambitions. So over the last five years, we've averaged 80% of our first time applicants to med school. So our students who are applying to med school, 80% of them on their first try are admitted to at least one med school. And when I first got that stat, I was a little bit, I was like, oh, four out of five, is that, are we, is that good? Are we, are we happy with that? So the national average for that statistic is 41%. So yes, we are very proud of that. It's nearly twice the, the national average. And um, we think this has a lot to do, not just with our amazing students, okay? We have great students to work with from, from the start, um, but also our rigorous set of classes that really set students up with the, the background knowledge that they, they need to go on to med school, but also the opportunities to do research, not just in our biology and chemistry and biophysics labs, but also in our med school. So WashU Med is a top ranked research oriented medical school. And about half of our students in the life sciences who are doing research are actually doing it in the med school's labs. And so you have these really great opportunities to get hands-on experience with specifically medically oriented research. Our students also have the opportunity to get some clinical experience. So we have a course that you can enroll in called Med Prep. And in the first semester, it gives you kind of an overview. Different people from our med school come and talk about different aspects of applying to med school and being a med student and residency and dealing with insurance and all kind of the, the reality of what pursuing a, a medical path looks like. And then in the second semester, you're matched up with uh, an emergency room. You, you do emergency room shadowing at Barnes Jewish, which is our, um, our the teaching hospital associated with our medical school. There's other opportunities to get hands-on clinical experience that we support for our students as well. And so when you add on top of that, a really robust pre-health advising program where um, students have access to pre-health resources at any time, but during the year leading up to their application, they work one-on-one -on -one with a pre-health advisor to really narrow in on their list of places to apply, to hone their personal statement, to do mock interviews, uh, and really make sure they've developed the competencies that, that medical schools are looking for. And so we think that's the package that helps our students do so well in the, the process of applying to med school. Now, we also have a lot of students who are interested in applying to law school and applying to master's or PhD programs. The, the, we have a little bit more of a structured process for advising pre-med simply because the process of applying to med school is so structured itself with very specific prerequisites. Law school doesn't have anywhere near the same rigid set of things you have to do uh, in order to apply to law school. So we have pre-law advising, we have, we just call it pre-grad for, for a master's and PhD um, that also have great track records, but we don't have the same kind of data or necessarily rigid structure that we have for pre-med just because of the, the differences in, in the process. Now, I spent some time talking about that because that is a big thing for us. It is our most popular uh, academic area, but by no means does that, that suggest we're all pre-meds. We're, we're not. Um, all of those areas that I mentioned have robust student interest. 
one of the fastest growing areas of our curriculum over the last couple of years is actually creative writing. And um, I, I need to update this presentation. Uh, so I, I still have a lot of 2019 data in here. 20, 2020 is the blur that I wish I could forget. So I didn't update my, my data, but I need to get on that. So uh, we really have seen we have more than 200 students minoring in writing now. That's up from nowhere near that uh, and an and increase interest in the writing major. St. Louis, people don't think of us that way, but we have a remarkably vibrant literary scene with a lot of amazing young authors, uh, a top-ranked Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing that draws a lot of young authors to St. Louis. So um, that community supports a lot of really fun, small, interactive creative writing workshop classes that have become something our students try, not just because they think they want to either as a, a hobby or as a profession be a writer, but just to try using a different part of their brain. Um, for the last five semesters in a row now, uh, our, our student newspaper always has an edition right before students pick classes that says, you know, classes you shouldn't miss, great, great classes. Uh, and there's been a creative writing class on that list for the last five semesters in a row. So these, these have, have generated a lot broader interest than just people who really want to make writing a focus. It's become a fun thing to try. Like I have a chemistry major advisee who's taken two semesters of poetry writing and an anthropology major who's really gotten into um, creative nonfiction writing. So it's a fun, creative um, outlet for many of our students. Okay. So I said I was going to tell you a little bit more about the first year programs because we're very excited about them. If you want to know all the details beyond what I'm going to give you, there's a, I've listed a website here that runs through each of the, the programs that we're offering kind of in the current cycle, the current year. We have a couple different categories of these first year programs, as you no doubt can guess. Uh, the one thing that is in common with all of these is that they are limited to first year students. So you can only do these when you're a first year. Uh, and they all are also organized, they have classes associated with them. You enroll in one or more classes as a part of these first year programs. But that's about the only thing that's common across all of them. The, the most common form is something that I'm sure you've heard about at, at other places, a first year seminar. It's exactly what you think it is. It's a small class, you know, typically about 15, never any more than 19, uh, taught by a professor almost always in their area of research expertise or in an area that they're excited about exploring. And the cool thing about first year seminars, so first of all, they're great places to make connections. Why we like having first years in them is that you really get to know the other students, you get to know the faculty member. Um, Pre-COVID, I would always have my first year seminar over to my house for dinner, and I'm looking forward to being able to, to do that again. A lot of my colleagues would, would do the same with their first year seminars. So it's just a great place to come together with 12, 13 other people who also find this topic super interesting and uh, really get to, to know them. The other thing about first year seminars, though, is that they, they're deeply focused. Their classes on a particular idea or concept or subfield. And, and so they're a nice complement to a lot of the other things you do typically in your first year of college where you're, you're laying the groundwork for your future study. So a lot of times in your first year, you are taking introductory courses, you know, introductory to microeconomics or introductory to introduction to psychology. And these tend to be broad, but relatively shallow classes. They're introducing you to all these different um, aspects of the field so that you then have this foundation to, to move forward from. And the first year seminars are, are really unpacking a particular idea. They're, they're getting in deep, they're getting into the details, they're getting into the nuance where things get messy and complicated. And so they're also a really good introduction to the kind of sophisticated inquiry that is the, the wellspring of research. And so we see them also as um, not just ways to, uh, to make connections with people, but to begin to explore uh, the, the world of research. And so we offer these across all of our departments and programs. The picture that I have here 
is referring to one in the linguistics program that's on the linguistics of constructed languages. And so the class is about how would someone go about using the, the natural laws of language developed, you know, discovered by linguists over the years, would figure out how to create their own language from scratch, just create a completely new language. And that has commercial applications for things like computer programming languages, but also uh, for, for fiction and some authors that really did the hard work of trying to create realistic languages, Tolkien's Elvish being one of them, which is what that picture is. But regardless of your interests, there are, are many, many different options. So my department has one on habitable planets, like how would you know if a planet were capable of supporting life? What would that look like? How would we know? What's the science we use to try and, and determine that? There's one on detective fiction in the English department. There's one on the James Bond movie franchise in the film and media studies department. And that that is always that group, whenever a new Bond movie comes out, like they even if they're seniors now, they get together with their professor and all go to see it. So that's definitely one that has created lasting friendships and memories for for a number of students. There's one in biology on the secret lives of plants. There's one in education on controversy surrounding school choice. You get the idea. Um, and so you, you have the opportunity to choose something that just sounds like fun. Now, our first year seminars tend to be three credit classes, which is for us a standard lecture class. Uh, if a course that meets more often during the week, like a language class that meets every day or a lab class that has a big lab meeting for a couple hours a week, those may be four or five credits. And students typically take 15 credits a semester. And so that's five lecture classes or fewer if you're, if you're looking at language or lab classes. Sometimes students have so many areas they want to explore during their first year that they find that a first year seminar, it just isn't going to fit. It's up against too many other classes they want to take. And so we have these one credit options called first year opportunities. And those tend to be once a week. Uh, and they don't usually have a lot of work outside that showing up for that one class meeting. And so they're another great way to connect with first year students. And this time, rather than getting in deep to something, you get exposed to an idea or a range of opportunities. So the, the picture I have for this one is referring to a first year opportunity that takes our students behind the scenes at the St. Louis Zoo and the Missouri Botanical Gardens, both of which, if you have the chance to visit St. Louis, I recommend highly. Uh, but you go behind the scenes and you meet with some of the research scientists working there who are doing conservation and biodiversity research, not just in St. Louis, but globally, uh, and many times in collaboration with scholars at WashU. And so it's a really cool introduction, not just to some pretty awesome St. Louis institutions, but also to the different opportunities and options there are for, for careers in biodiversity and conservation. Others have faculty coming to the students, and so we have a number where it's basically a different faculty member comes each week and talks about their research. And so by the end of the uh, semester, you've met 14 different faculty in psychology, and you have a really good idea of what they do, and you've made personal connections. So if you want to get involved, you have a place to, to start from. Still others are more introductions to ideas or concepts. Uh, so we have one taught by one of our neuroscience faculty on the science and practice of mindfulness. And so you learn to practice mindfulness, but you also learn from this neuroscientist a little bit about kind of the state of the science in what we understand about how mindfulness actually impacts brain function. So that's pretty cool. Now, on the other end of the commitment spectrum from our first year opportunities are ampersand programs. Uh, we are a huge fans of the ampersand in arts and sciences. It's the, the our logo and our newsletter, because if you have to pick one thing that encompasses all of what we do in arts and sciences, it's that bringing together of, of all of these different disciplines and ideas. So we like the ampersand. Ampersand programs are more than one semester and they're more than classroom learning. So the most common format of an ampersand program is a two semester, a year long seminar. Uh, again, these are small, typically 15 ish, never more than 18, 19, um, sometimes 12 uh, courses. So you're, you're in the seminar all year and then you travel for a week and a half to two weeks, kind of a, a mini 
study abroad experience with all of the students in your class and, and the faculty and you're learning about the, uh, the places that you've been, you're, you're going to the places you've been learning about in the classroom all year. So this picture is from one of our ampersand programs called the History and Remembrance of the Holocaust. And uh, over the year, it's, it's co-taught by a professor in, um, in, in history and one who's jointly appointed in German and in Jewish, Islamic, and Middle Eastern studies. And you learn not just about the history of the Holocaust, but also the ways in which film and literature have told the story of the Holocaust. And then you go to Germany, Poland, and Lithuania for 10, 12 days and visit some of the physical memorials to the Holocaust to learn a little bit more about the importance of place in remembrance. So like I said, that's the most common model. We have one on the literary culture of modern Ireland, can figure out where that one goes. Uh, there are some that travel domestically. So there's uh, one on crossing borders and migration that goes to Arizona. There's one on urban crisis and renewal that travels to different cities in the US. Um, and then there's one called the Global Citizenship Program out of our Global Studies major that goes to different places depending on the research area of the faculty member who's leading it that year. So they went to Japan one year, they went to Costa Rica, get the idea. Still others of the ampersand programs are really focused on a, getting a deep research experience. And so uh, our Mind Brain Behavior Program pairs a year-long seminar in cognitive science with, in your sophomore year, each student in the program is placed in a cognitive neuroscience research lab to start doing independent research. And you still come together as a cohort and you, you talk to the students that you were in this year-long seminar with about the process of research and getting into research challenges um, and what you're finding. So it's a bit of a community surrounding that first real research experience. Then still others of our ampersand programs connect students to internship or service opportunities. So there's one ampersand program run out of our anthropology department called Medicine and Society. And it's really focused on um, understanding community health and the role of community in health outcomes um, and really approaching disease and wellness from the standpoint of uh, bark dogs again, sorry, of, of broader community influences. And so over that program, uh, students actually will spend at least one summer doing either an internship or service with a community health organization, either in St. Louis, I'm sorry, the dogs are going crazy, either in St. Louis or closer to home if you want to be home over the summer, the program helps you find opportunities that are, are closer to you. So uh, hopefully you get an idea of why we're so excited about these programs because they really do provide in your first year a connection to all of these things that we really want our students to, to take advantage of. Now these different um, programs that I've been talking about are all arts and sciences programs. So they're, they're specific for the school. Um, Beyond Boundaries is one other thing I wanna mention, um, which is cross school. It's, it's open to all Washington University undergrads there's a specific program that you can apply to called Beyond Boundaries. And if you're interested in that, uh, if you just Google it, you'll find more information. But the program sponsors first year classes that are open to anybody, not just um, any first year student. You don't have to be part of the program. You can be in any school. And these are cross-disciplinary classes co-taught by faculty across our schools, including the graduate only schools like law and social work and medicine. And the idea is to give students an experience in their first year that demonstrates how powerful it can be to bring different expertises together, different perspectives together on big challenges or big questions. And so there's a class on climate change that has engineers and, and anthropologists and public health scientists and green business uh, interested folks, you get the idea. There's um, this picture is from one called The Art of Medicine that looks at the ways in which depictions of health and illness and doctors and patients have changed through space and time. Uh, there's one called Morality and Markets that's co taught by one of our English faculty and a business faculty um, that looks at uh, questions of ethics in 
um, business related decisions and how we have different frameworks for, for making those. Hopefully you get the idea, right? And so we certainly encourage our arts and sciences students to take advantage of these Beyond Boundaries courses because they really just at a slightly larger scale get at exactly that ampersand ideal that we, we really, really value in arts and sciences. Okay, I'm going to take a step back and a quick drink from throwing a lot of information at you to talk for just a couple of minutes about what I think is actually the most important part of trying to figure out where you want to go to college. And that is getting a sense of the intellectual community that you would be joining. Now, I know there's so much that goes into picking the right college for you. And is it uh, large or small in an urban or a rural setting? Does it have the, the academic programs and the areas that you're interested in? And all of those are very important. But the thing that I think ultimately does drive your experience and how much you grow and how much you move towards becoming the person that you really aspire to be, it's about the community. It's about the other people around you. And Yes, you know, I've been mentioning our faculty and how great they are, and that's important. We want you to learn from us, learn a lot from us. That's our job. But you will also learn so much from your peers, from, you know, your, your roommate that you have a philosophical argument with at three in the morning in your dorm room, to your lab partner, to the group you're working on a project with in one of your classes, to the person who brings up a perspective in your discussion seminar that you never would have thought of. And that those interactions are, are just incredibly foundational to the kind of experience that you have in college. And so it's hard to give you a sense of that and particularly hard um, over Zoom, right, to, to give you a sense of what that community is like. So I'm gonna try and do this a little bit using a tradition that we've had in arts and sciences for the last nine years now, where I meet with all of our incoming students during new student orientation um, and you know, in, in a big lecture hall uh, auditorium. And one of the things that I do is hand out these squares of fabric and ask each student to write or draw what they hope for themselves over the next four years. And then we collect them and we stick them all together and they go on the wall in my office, which I miss dearly. We have um, students and classes and things on campus, but most of our administrative staff like me is working from home. So I haven't been in the office uh, in, in a while now, but it uh, goes up on the wall in my office because ultimately I come to work or I work every day hoping to uh, support our students in achieving their goals. And so you see, this is the one that we are going to bring out during commencement this upcoming May, the class of 2021. And so we bring these back. And after graduation, um, and we have a little reception afterwards, we, we put this up and students come in their caps and gowns and try and find uh, the fabric square that encapsulated their dreams before they even started their first class. So it's a fun tradition. But if you look at the trends in what our students say they hope for, uh, and then you add those up over the last nine years, I think you do get a sense of who WashU Arts Eye students are. So I picked out some of my favorites, some of the more common ones to try and, and help you uh, get that sense. So we do see a lot. One common theme is students who are hoping to create something. Uh, so coming up with a new idea, making a research discovery, writing the next great American novel, starting up a business in their dorm room. Um, we have a lot of students in arts and sciences who are hoping to create something. And then, you know, I talked about service and volunteering. We do have so many people who want to be change agents. They want to make a difference. They want to have a positive impact. They want to grow in their skills, not just for themselves, but in their capacity to to be a force for good in the world. And then we have a lot of students who are hoping they're gonna figure out just what it is they want to do with themselves in the next phase of their life. We have some people with particular academic areas of interest. Uh, so this person expresses themselves through math. They, they hope that the change in themselves, del me over del time uh, is infinite. So that would be vertical growth. And I started using this as an example to incoming classes about the kinds of different things that their peers had, had chosen. And I very mistakenly referred to this for a couple of years as a math joke. 
it is not funny and i understand that and so it was driven home to me when i saw this next fabric square where apparently i inspired someone to try and come up with better math jokes uh during their their time in college so one thing i do really love about washu students is their sense of humor um something that that makes being a part of the washu community just so enjoyable is that you know our students are really 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 smart of course and they take their work really seriously but they don't take themselves overly seriously uh, and and that just makes interaction with our student body an absolute delight so here's somebody not as much uh leaning towards math they hope that their pen will be equal to a sword and i always say i might have gone with greater than like pen is mightier than the sword but you know pen that's equal to a sword is still pretty good and that's not the math person that's the writer so that's great so some people come in with kind of different disciplinary leanings in, in what they're hoping to, to learn about. Some people come in with really specific goals, helping people with severe allergies. Other people come in with multiple goals. This person will, double underlined, be an articulate trilingual entrepreneur who possesses integrity, tenacity, and benevolence. <laughs> like, I'm going to stay out of your way. Uh, so multiple goals for some people. Uh, here's somebody who hopes that their mind will be blown. Here's a rather more practical person that just wants to get a job that they're interested in versus somebody who wants to gain knowledge. And then every year there are people who don't take it as seriously as I maybe would have hoped that they would. Can't argue with maps and food, but uh, in terms of what you hope for yourself, I encourage our students to aim, aim higher. Now, there is one theme that is by far more common than any other, and, and it's this one. I have so many of these fabric squares in which students are, are saying that they really want to, to find the, their thing, uh, figure out what they want out of their life, find what makes them happy. Um, I still love, this is one of my all-time favorites, learn about my passions or something. Good, I'm glad you have that out there that, you know, if you don't find your passions, you're still going to learn about something. Because you're not learning about anything, I'm probably going to get to know you pretty well as Dean, and like that's not going to be a, a, a good thing. So this is what we see by far uh, the, the, in the most common of, of all the themes. And I think it makes sense. You know, one of the things that people tell us they come to Washington for is the amount of flexibility that we have for students to, to study Across our schools, arts and sciences students can take classes and second major and minor in the art school, in the business school, in the engineering school. And same thing for engineers and business students and art and architecture students. Um, you can move between schools if that's what you want. 74% um, of our students have more than a major. They have an, a minor, second major, two majors and a minor. You know, our students are, are interested in multiple things. And I think because of that, because we bring people to us that have all of those interests, we have a lot of people that are trying to figure out just what it is they want to do. Um, and this is somewhat unique about WashU. So we, we have a student body survey that we do every other year. And the last three or four times that we've done that student body survey, uh, we've gotten an answer to the question, did you know what you wanted to study when you started college? And we've gotten a pretty consistent set of 35 to 40% of our students tell us no. They did not know what they wanted to study when they started college. Uh, and our peers, so that same student body survey is done by a bunch of peer institutions as well, the kinds of places that students who apply to us typically also apply to those institutions. And the, the average there is 25% of their students not knowing what they want to study. And so I think you do see something unique about us in that we're really a place that celebrates this exploration and that wants to help students navigate all these different options and, and find something that's really going to, to work for them. Now, so 35 to 40%, that means that 60 to 65% of our students do come in with an idea of what they want to study. Turns out about half of them will change their minds. So it's a pretty even third, third, third. A third of our students don't know what they want to study. A third of our students comes in with an idea but changes their mind. And a third of our students uh, studies exactly what they thought they were going to study when they, they came to college. And 
So a lot of our advising system was built around this idea that the majority of our students are either discovering or adjusting their interests during their, their first couple of years in college. And so that's one of the reasons why we've invested as much as we have in our advising system. So we have um, a set of four-year advisors that you start talking to before you set foot on campus um, in the summer before uh, your first semester. We help you pick your classes. We start to get to know you because we believe that's actually the best way. We can help you figure out what your path, what the best path for you or the best path in the moment for you actually is. So you, once you do settle on and declare a major, which for us, the deadline for doing so, it's actually just coming up at the end of this week for sophomores. So you have until February of your sophomore year to declare a major. Uh, and at that point, you will add uh, an advisor, a faculty advisor associated with the major. Same thing for any minor that you declare. You get specialist advisors in your major or minor, but you keep as the name suggests, your four-year advisor. And that works out well because, you know, if you're going to change your mind or if you're reevaluating, this is somebody that has known you since the beginning. You know, and I was just having a conversation with um, one of my sophomores who has picked a major and isn't entirely sure, and we were trying to rethink, and I said, well, you know, do you remember you, you loved your philosophy course in your first semester? Does it maybe make sense to try another philosophy class this semester just to see if actually maybe that's a direction you, you want to go either as a second major or a minor, or maybe you want to switch? But it's, it's that kind of, of knowledge and being along with our students on the, on the journey that we really um, value out of this, this four-year advising. And like I said as well, if you have particular pre-professional interests, you get advising for that. If you're going to study abroad, there are study abroad advisors. So there is no shortage uh, of advice, and we really want our students to learn how to um, build relationships and network and get the best advice they can find from the right people to give it. Um, and so that's why we kind of, we, we believe in this dispersed model of advising, but the idea is that your four-year advisor is kind of the central hub and you've got all these other specialist advisors that can help you with the particular questions that um, pertain to those areas. Now, okay, it's, it's nice to say find your passion and all of that stuff, but we want our students to be really well prepared for whatever their next step is, is going to be. So if you want to know more about where our students uh, go after they graduate from WashU, oh, so much barking, I am so sorry. Uh, I, I again refer you to this website that has a lot more data than what I'm showing here. So if you go onto the website, not only do you see these general categories, but you, there's a drop down menu and you can sort by major and you see not just the categories, but also the job titles and the employers and the specific graduate medical law schools that students from that major went on to. So much, much, much more data available online, but this gives you the very general picture. So nearly a quarter of our students in the class of 2019 went straight on to more school, which makes sense, right? I talked about how many students we do have pursuing medical and law careers or advanced degrees in different subjects. And actually, the bulk of students in this green and purple, the internship, research, volunteer, and other, are ones that are planning on getting an advanced degree, but they want to take a year or two either to narrow in on um, the particular subfield to spend some time in service, to spend some time giving back before they, they go on in school, or just to, to get a year or two away from writing papers and taking tests before they dive back into to all of that. I mean, in still other fields, uh, clinical psychology, expect that you're going to have a full-time year or two of research under your belt before you apply to PhD programs, so some students are, are doing precisely that. Now, if I were you, I would be saying, what is this other? So full transparency, uh, for our, our class of 2019 outcomes, about 6.5%, so slightly less than half of this uh, purple bar, were still applying to graduate programs and jobs at the time of graduation. I would far rather frame that as 93.5% of our students had their next opportunity lined up at the time, um, at the time of graduation. So that's what other is. Other is still looking. 
uh, and it was for 2019 about six and a half percent. So half of our students go right on into the world of work and the jobs are as diverse as our students. And so again, the best thing I can, I can suggest if you wanna know more is to check out the website, sort by major. You'll see a lot of things that I think make sense. Um, like yes, uh, a lot of our econ majors are going into jobs in the finance industry. And yes, it is a lot of our biology majors that are going on to med school, though you do not have to major in biology to, to go on to med school. That interest in the life sciences is what draws a lot of people to the study of medicine. But you'll also find some things that I bet would surprise you. And so I've collected uh, from a couple of years ago, and I just love these examples so much that I haven't gone searching for ones I like just as much. Uh, so these are six graduates from um, a couple of years ago. There are six majors and the six next steps that they uh, that they went on to. So obviously that I'm showing you these, right? It means that they're not going to match up the way you might have predicted. So who went on to an MIT PhD program, an economics major? Who went into marketing, one of our French majors? How about JP Morgan, actually a chemistry major, went to work for JP Morgan. A math major went to work for MasterCard. Now, that may be a little bit more intuitive in that um, our math majors get jobs as analysts in a wide range of, of fields. Um, similarly, actually, our political science department has a real strength in quantitative methodology. And so that's polling, um, analysis of large survey data sets, um, game theory, the modeling of negotiation and bargaining, uh, which all of which has very clear uh, applications to understanding political data, but is incredibly useful in a wide range. Those skills are incredibly useful in a wide range of fields. So we actually see our political science majors getting tech and, and, and analyst jobs uh, with some real frequency, which leaves our art historian going on to law school. Now, we think this works, that our students are able to do so much more than you might have just imagined knowing what they were majoring in, because we are a liberal arts school. We have a broad set of degree requirements, distribution requirements that all of our students take. So you complete a major and you do your distribution requirements. Now, I'm well aware that uh, most people, much like most people are not that excited about rocks, most, most people are not that excited about curriculum details. So I'm not going to go through all of this. I just want to make two points. One is that we don't have a really structured core curriculum where everybody has to take the same set of, of specific classes. We only have one specific class that all of our students take. That's our first year writing class called college writing, which you take either in, in the fall or spring of your first year. And as I said, our students are amazing. And, and they, this is not, nor do they need a class in, in structuring grammatical sentences. This is rather a class that focuses on building our students' capacity to write really robust written arguments that are solidly grounded in well-researched evidence, because we believe that that is crucial, not just to success in college, but to whatever it is you're, you're moving on to. And so students can pick the, the topic or the theme that they're writing about, but that syllabus, the set of, of assignments is standard across. Um, so everybody takes that. The other point is that all the rest of these are categories um, where many, many classes satisfy those categories and you just have to complete the category except for music lessons and some of our physical education classes. We do have some physical education classes for credit uh, and we do have music lessons that you can take for credit. Pretty much everything else that we offer falls into one, if not more than one of these categories. So as you're exploring, as you're completing the requirements for your major, as you're doing a minor, you are, are satisfying um, your, your requirements for your degree. So it still gives you a lot of flexibility in how just exactly what you'll pick to, um, to take care of all of these degree requirements. So the last thing before uh, I, I leave us the last 10 minutes or so for questions is to just touch back to the idea of majors. Uh, we have a lot of them. I've mentioned a bunch already. I mean, we have everything that you would expect a college to have. Um, but we also have some interdisciplinary programs that are a little bit more unique to WashU. This is not by any means a comprehensive list. This is just some of our newer and more popular interdisciplinary programs. 
So environmental analysis is not quite a year old. So we have uh, much older kind of disciplinary environmental majors. You can study environmental biology. You can study environmental policy. You can study environmental earth sciences. But environmental analysis is a cross-cutting major that really focuses on developing students' skill sets and kind of toolkits to address complicated environmental problems. And so the classes are, are really focused on that skill building. So there are things like um, writing for environmental professionals. There's a, a there's an additional communications uh, requirement that there are a bunch of, of opportunities to fulfill. There's methods in conservation biology. There's policy analysis. There's geographic information science. It's really focused on um, helping you understand different frameworks to ask and, and answer environmental questions. Um, on the other hand, PNP, Philosophy, Neuroscience, Psychology, is one of our oldest and most popular interdisciplinary programs. You can major in any one of these three things at WashU, either philosophy or neuroscience or psychology. But if you're really interested in kind of the whole story from the hardware of the neurons in the brain to kind of the psychology, the software, the processing, to the philosophy of consciousness, that whole holistic understanding of the mind and the brain, that's PNP would be a major that allows you to kind of explore across and build, build um, depth across those different aspects of understanding the, the brain and the mind. Finally, um, I want to just mention computer science lives in the engineering school, not in arts and sciences. It's a very common double major, second major for our students or minor for our students. Um, and we were finding, though, that there were some combinations that were particularly pop popular, particularly meaningful. And so we have these joint majors. So in math and computer science or in econ and computer science, and people always say, well, what's the difference between that and a double major? It's fewer classes. So the single joint major is kind of the core of the double major. It doesn't have quite as many breadth electives as you would take if you were doing a full double major in math and computer science or econ and computer science. But it gives you, again, that core skill set in both of those disciplines. It really sets you up to, um, to have a competency in both the areas, but gives you a little bit more flexibility in your schedule if you want to pursue a minor in art or fluency in a foreign language or whatever else you want to do. So it's an opportunity to study those two things um, in a slightly more compacted form than a double major. Okay, finally, uh, I, am, I am done throwing information at you, and we do have just about 10 minutes for questions. So, um, as I'd said earlier, you're welcome to just go ahead and stick them in the chat. If you miss, um, if you don't have a chance to put something in the chat, you're welcome to follow up with me by email, and we can go from there. So, okay. Uh, if you double major, do both majors have to be in the same school or college? No. So you have to have one major in the school you're in, like the school you're going to get your degree from. So if you're in arts and sciences, you have to have one major in arts and sciences. And so um, same thing for all the schools. So if students, a common um, combination is marketing and psychology, marketing in the business school, psychology in arts and sciences. And so if you thought you were going to do both, and then ultimately you decided, you know what, I only want to major in marketing. I don't want to major in psychology. You would actually, if you were an arts and sciences student, you would have to transfer to the business school to only have a major in the business school. But you can, and many people do, have second majors across schools. What's the average number of students in arts and sciences classes? So our average class size is somewhere in the 20 some odd um, range. We do have some large lecture classes, dominantly these intro level classes, dominantly in the sciences and math. Um, our largest lecture hall seats 360 people. Um, and so there are a couple classes that have multiple sections. But um, typically, once you get past those big first year classes, uh, it, it gets a lot smaller. So, and we try and make sure, so those college writing, the first year writing class, those are all in sections of 12 people. Our language classes tend to be capped at 12. Our creative writing classes are capped at 12. And so we work with our first year students if they're really doing a lot of these big intro classes to make sure they always find um, one or two slots in their schedule to have a, a smaller class. And then it just becomes a lot easier to do that moving forward. 
Um, let's see. I have a bunch of what teaching style do most professors here use discussion based or lecture based? So there's no one. I mean, there is very little lecture based in, say, comparative literature, right? Almost, almost none. Um, most of our science and math classes have really tried to move away from the straight lecture to more of an active learning where the professor may talk for 10 or 15 minutes and then he'll break you or she will break you up into small groups, have you discuss a problem, they'll circulate through the room, um, talk to the groups and then come back and share answers. So we're really moving away. You will see that lecture format. Um, in some of those intro classes, but once you get out of that um, kind of 100 level class, the, the lecture becomes much less common. And when you have it, it tends to be a lot more interactive with um, questions going back and forth throughout the entirety of the class period and not just waiting to the end. Do most people who earn a PNP degree go on to med school? <laughs> so that's that's really interesting. Actually, there are just about as many students who go on to law school from PNP as there are uh, med school from PNP. And the other, there's there's three common career outcomes for PNP: pre-med, pre-law, and business consulting. Um, because actually, that problem solving, that understanding of cognition and the way the brain works, is actually really useful in um, these kind of consulting, problem-solving type uh, business-oriented jobs. So yes, a lot of our pre-professional, pre-med and pre-law um, go PNP, uh, and then so too do some of our business-interested students. I should say there's two tracks to PNP. One is one leans a little bit more on the neuroscience and psychology, so a little bit more of the quote hard science. Um, called, it's called cognitive neuroscience. That tends to be the pre-med route, and then there's one called language, cognition, and culture that has a little bit more linguistics, a little bit more philosophy of language, um, intro to human evolution. That tends to be where the pre-law students um, go. I mean, and all of them cover all of the three fields, but the two tracks kind of lean uh, in, in other directions. And the, the business students go, business-oriented students go in, in both tracks. Um, let's see. Average teacher to student ratio in arts and sciences. Man, I, I don't want to get that wrong. I want to say that we're around 10 to 1, 11. I don't quote me on that. I wish I had that number in my head, but I do not have it in my head. I apologize. Um, let's see. What types of courses are available for microbiology, cellular biology, or stem cell research? So there is a... Um, uh, molecular micro focus concentration in the biology major and so there are a bunch of there's upper level biology majors all do at least one upper level lab class and those lab classes are really focused on um, doing some independently driven research so there is I know there's specifically um, a microbiology advanced lab course. Um, there is also an upper level cell, bi like cell biology. So those things are specific upper level courses that we have, uh, microbio, cell bio. Um, and in terms of, of stem cell research, that kind of research is going on in a number of the research labs, um, more at the med school. Uh, and so we don't do as much specific course engagement with that, but there certainly are research opportunities. Um, when will WashU release the testing policy for class of 2026, entering fall 2022? Pretty soon. I know we're we're in those. I saw an email go by about finalizing that decision just last week, so it should be pretty soon. Um, keep yeah, stay stay tuned. Um, how many students are transfers, and are there any resources for transfer students? So we don't tend to have a huge number of transfer students. We only bring in about 30 per year. Um, and so it's a small group. One of the folks in, in the college office is our designated transfer advisor point person. Um, and so there's, there's uh, focus there in the specific needs of, of transfer students. Um, but it's a small enough cohort that we, we foster uh, community and group engagement with our transfer students and um, they tend to be a, a tight network themselves and really do a lot of, of support um, for each other. Oh, somebody asked me about uh, 
fossils and geological projects. So I used to do, before I became an administrator, I used to do a ton of field work and I spent most of my time actually in, in the Egyptian Sahara. And so I miss the desert. I miss the desert a lot. Um, yeah. What major is most common for students who want to go on to med school? Biology is, is most common, but it is um, not a quarter of our successful applicants to med school don't even do a natural science major at all, not bio, not, bio, not chemistry, not math. We see zero um, distinction in the acceptance rates of our psychology, sociology, classics, major pre-meds do just as well with admissions to med school as our bio major pre-meds, but bio is the, excuse me, is the most popular. Um, let's see. What is one of the traditions at your school that difference, differs from the other schools? Well, our little, the little quilt thing that I showed is like totally ours. Um, I don't know of any other, anybody else who, I'm sure somebody does something like that, but I don't know. Um, we also have, so I, I have some personal traditions, and that is that I bring my giant fluffy dogs that you heard uh, to before some of the big evening exams, um, particularly for these first year classes, we go and stand in the walkway between the dorms and where the exams are, and they have little shirts that they wear that say pet me for luck, and they greet students that are going to their, their first big college exams. So. That's kind of my tradition, but uh, it's, it's fun. Um, acceptance rate for biology majors. So I don't, we, we don't, um, you're, you're admitted to the school and you get to pick your major and there's no application process that's specific to the, the major. So um, you, you don't necessarily need to indicate a particular interest at the time of, of application. We have a ton of people who apply undecided. And, and there's not um, there's not a distinction. And once you're admitted, you just declare whatever major you you want. Um, what do people major in if they want to go into dental school? Also, I mean, biology is again uh, pretty common, but it is the same set of you just have to complete the specific course requirements, and there's enough room to do that around or with whatever major you're interested in. I've definitely seen some students um, who are interested in practicing in a particular community or place um, combine their pre-dental work with a, a language major. Um, so we have Spanish major dentists and French major dentists, but yeah, it really is you can you can choose your major um, based on your, your interest. How many kids take advantage of the 3-2 engineering program? So it's our students, so the 3-2 with engineering tends to be students who come in from um, liberal arts colleges after three years of bachelor's there and then um, complete an engineering and accredited engineering degree in another two years. And so it's not usually our arts and sciences students. That, that do that if they want to get an accredited engineering degree, they'll transfer over to the engineering school. What we do see is a lot of our students doing, it's more of a full one. They'll, they'll do an accelerated master's program, most commonly in computer science, where they start taking those graduate level computer science classes in their senior year uh, with us in arts and sciences, and then they get a master's in one more year. So same, same outcome, five years uh, with two degrees, but um, more of your you're still kind of dominantly an undergrad through four years and you know i don't i advise a lot of science and math oriented students and so my gut for how many people take advantage of that is going to be a little high because that's the those are the students that i see um, a lot but my sense is that those one-year master's programs in engineering are pretty common um, that, that a lot of students do take advantage of that Okay, it looks like we are out of questions and out of time. And so thank you. So I hope wherever you are that you are warm um, and uh, doing well. And please enjoy the rest of your Tuesday and stay safe and warm and healthy and all that good stuff. Take care.